Welcome to the Got Questions podcast. Uh, so Gwen, who's the uh, associate editor here at Got Questions Ministries and also our volunteer coordinator, and Nelson, the director of video content, are going to be joining me for this new series that we're going to be doing on the attributes of God. We're going to be covering all the major attributes, um, ones you're familiar with, maybe ones you're not so familiar with. But today we're going to be covering two of them we think are pretty closely related. And first is um, the holiness of God. And second, the incomprehensibility of God. Um, the holiness of God is something that is throughout Scripture. Um, it's something that a term that everyone's familiar with, but maybe not um, in terms of what does it actually mean that God is holy, and how does that actually impact us, and to what degree is this the attribute of God that we can emulate in our lives? So, Gwen, what, to start us off, um, what does it mean? that God is holy. Uh, so that God is holy basically means he is set apart. So this refers to God's otherness. Um, but when we're talking about God being holy, a lot of people refer to this as um, kind of the most essential attribute of God. He's completely other. So we'll talk about this later in the podcast, but his holiness is something that we are in fact commanded to emulate, um, but will never be as separate as God. Um, so some of the verses I like about holiness um, are Exodus 15, 11 through 13. And this is Moses' song of gratitude and worship after God has taken the Israelites out of Egypt. It says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. So we see there, it's just this, who is like God? He's so other. He's so different. He does these magnanimous things. And then he leads his people to his holy separate abode. But it's not just for the Israelites. In Psalm 96, we read, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Um, so I know for me, when I think of the holiness of God, it causes me to stand in awe and to want to worship. Um, Nelson, how do you interact with the holiness of God? The holiness of God is... It's just an incredible attribute when you think about the otherness of God, completely separate, right? That's what holy means. It means to be completely separate. And there's no other attribute in Scripture where you see the angels cry out three times, right? As in Scripture does, holy, holy, holy. It doesn't say love, 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 or justice, 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 or wrath, wrath, wrath. It says holy. And it emphasizes that attribute on nearly on another level because God is completely other, right? Who compares to God? Who is like God? And, and, and we know that in God, there is no darkness at all. In scripture, he's described as pure light, completely absent of darkness. And in scripture, light is truth and goodness. Uh, and in scripture, the darkness refers to sin and, and wrongdoing and things like that, uh, evil. And so as you think about God, he's completely pure. And our minds can't even comprehend that. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about the incomprehensibility of God in a bit, but... Um, yeah, when I think about God being holy, I, I, I think of uh, the, the, the saints and um, the, our forefathers who, who, when presented in the presence of God, couldn't even say a word. Their, their being, just them being in his presence, caused them to fall face down on the ground, uh, remembering just how unholy they were. Their mouths had profaned him. They've said evil things. They, their clothes were dirty. They've done evil things as well. And so we understand that God is completely other on a completely separate plane uh, than us. And so his holiness uh, is far beyond our comprehension. Uh, and so when we think about it, yeah, it means completely separate, completely good, completely righteous uh, and distinct than all others. So yeah, Nelson, that's a great point. When I think about the holiness of God, and how, in a sense, it connects to all the other attributes. God's love is set apart. It is otherly in comparison to our love, God's righteousness, his justice. Everything about God is 
set apart. It's perfect. It's um, there's no flaw in it. And the holiness of God impacts everything, just like the love of God impacts all of his attributes. So um, they're, they're not separate. And I think as we continue this conversation throughout this series, we'll see how the attributes of God are connected to one another. But the holiness of God, to me, is sort of the foundation. The fact that God is set apart um, impacts everything. It's a quality of God that like, nothing um, about us, nothing about even creation, even when it was perfect, it was still not holy in the same sense that God is holy. And that's both a comfort and also a challenge. Um, in Scripture, there are many commands in Scripture to be holy as God is holy. At the, one of my favorite verses, the beginning of First Corinthians, it uses the two terms related to holiness. It says, to the saints who are called to be holy— and that, those two words are actually the same word. So to the holy ones who are called to be holy. So because of our relationship with Christ, we are holy in God's sight, but we're also called to be holy in terms of to live up to the reality of who we are in Christ practically in our lives. So, so Nelson, when you think about holiness in terms of how it impacts you practically, what are some of the things that come to mind? Because God is holy, it helps me to understand why he hates sin and evil so much and, and why he distanced himself and can't have it near him. It's why heaven's exclusive, right? To those who've been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, who've been washed clean, who are, um, whose sins are washed and forgotten away. Because, because of God's holiness, if we were sinful, even just the smallest amount of sin, even just you know any sin at all, uh, we couldn't even stand in his presence because he is so separate and distinct that he can't even be in the presence. Or would he want to be in the presence of someone um, sinful like myself, apart from being washed from the blood of Jesus Christ? And so it reminds me why all sin is an affront to God's character. A lot of times I think we like to categorize our sins as this one's not so bad and this one's a lot worse, or they sin a lot worse than I do. And I think when we realize that all sin, no matter from what we might call the smallest to the largest, it all is still a distinction. It's all unholy. And, and it, it, that can't be brought into the presence of God. And we shouldn't be comfortable with living in sin. That isn't to say, of course, that Christians don't sin. We fail and we, we um, falter all the time. But we are redeemed in Jesus Christ. And he doesn't see our sins anymore. He sees us as his son uh, in his righteousness. Uh, and, and that's the only way we can be in God's presence is because of the righteousness that Jesus Christ has given to us. And, and that makes me see the value of the cross. It wasn't just uh, an act of love. It wasn't just a display that he cared for me that deeply. It was to prepare me and uh, make me holy to be prepared to be in his presence as well. Well, I think that's one of the um, ways that holiness is kind of one of those things that it sparks fear of, wow, like God is so separate and so holy that I can't be in his presence. But yeah, but also this deep gratitude of, but he's invited me in. And I love that um, in Jesus, like the cross isn't just about, okay, I've forgiven your sin. Now do a better job. It's I'm actually reconciling you to myself. I'm making you new. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit and like equipping you to live this life that I've called you to, to live by the design I gave you. So it's not like we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and now I have to live holy to please this big, scary God. It's part of God's otherness is that he does make us holy, like both in the reality, like declaring us to be holy and then helps us live it out. And I love that he invites us into um, being a reflection of who he is to the rest of the world. Like we are called to be set apart from the worldly ways as a light to who he is so that others can know him. And um, some great passages about this are in Exodus 19, when God is calling Israel, you know, it's, if you will obey me, you will be my special people, my treasured possession. But then we see that again in First Peter. Um, so this is First Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So it's it's like holiness is this thing that makes God other than us, but also this thing that he invites us into so that we can be like other also, which is just so cool. Yeah. So Gwen, that, that's an excellent segue. And we didn't even talk about this ahead of time into a question I just saw in the question system on Sunday, I believe. Someone asked the question. So in scripture, in two different occasions, Jesus says, go and sin no more. And then there are in a couple of places in scripture, God says, be holy as I am holy. Well, ultimately, you know that this side of eternity, that's not possible. So why would God give us a goal or tell us to be sinless, to be holy, when that's actually not possible? So how would you respond to that question? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, in some ways, so that kind of reminds me of the, of like First John one, eight through two, six is kind of like, don't sin. If you're following Jesus, you shouldn't be, but then also recognizes, but you're going to, but, and he's already forgiven you. So like you have an advocate who's forgiving. So, um, in a lot of ways, I think it just points to the grander redemptive narrative. Like we know we're living in that, um, in between moment where the promised savior has come and we have been restored, like that's justification. We've been declared holy. And right now we're in this progressive sanctification where we're learning how to live it out. And we have a new nature, but we also still have a sin nature. And so we're constantly having to put that old sin nature to death and put on the newness that we actually are. But one day we are going to be with Jesus and there won't be any sin. So in some ways, I wonder if Jesus is pointing to like, here's the bigger reality, here's where this is all heading. So live in that reality and kind of in as much as you are able, and then he's taking care of the rest of it. Yeah. Nelson, how would you respond to that question? Yeah, I think Paul struggled with the same thing, or you know, I, I do the things I don't want to do and the things I want to do, I don't do, and he struggles with sin. The apostle Paul, right, who wrote a majority of the New Testament. And so we know that Christians, inevitably fall short of the, the goal of, of complete holiness. But yet, that doesn't make us cease from striving to do it. God has set the ultimate. He is the standard of holiness. And he's empowered us through the Holy Spirit to live in light of that reality. And yet, why will you fail and fall? He still offers his forgiveness and encouragement. It's just it's like when a little child is, is learning to walk, um, we don't get mad that the child stumbles or that he falls. Um, we understand that that's part of their nature. That's part of their upbringing. And we know that in time they will, will run, <laughs> right, and, and leap and jump. And that's the same way it's going to be for us in eternity. When we cross uh, to be with Christ, it's going to be an amazing experience to, to not have to fight the sin nature in a sense, not to, to be able to live in, in a world, heaven, where where our sin isn't continually to dragging us down, where, where our body isn't um, desiring things that we shouldn't desire. So, yeah, sin is there. It's always going to be there, but I am glad that Christ doesn't look at me in my sin. He looks at me through the righteousness of Christ, and uh, that gives me confidence. And uh, yet his standard shows me that I keep on striving to do what he's asking me to do. And I do that out of love, not out of fear. I do it out of love for him. Yeah. Well, I love that confidence piece because it isn't, you know, so we know that we're going to sin, but we don't just, well, you know, like I'm going to mess up and that's fine because there is that God is holy. So there is that sense of fear and there is that I need to repent and I need to put my sin to death. But yeah, there's that confidence knowing, but nothing changes. Like I'm secure in Christ. And so I can fully fight to put things to death, knowing that it doesn't ultimately depend on me. So it's kind of this weird tension of work as hard as you can, knowing that none of it depends on you. And it's actually the Holy Spirit working in you. Yeah. Uh, when I've been asked that question, yeah, when I've been asked that question in the past, um, if someone had expressed it like it's like discouraging me, why would God give us a command that we can't actually reach? And I'm like, to me, it's not discouraging because again, we know we have the, the grace, we have the mercy, we have the forgiveness of God. Um, that doesn't mean we don't strive for it, like what you were saying, Nelson. Um, the best uh, maybe analogy I could think of would be like a sports team. So let's say 
Major League Baseball, there's 162 games in the regular season. That's a lot of games. The very best teams of all time will lose 50 games in a season. But they try to win every single game. Yet they know they're not going to. They know they're going to lose games. They know they're going to make mistakes. But that doesn't stop them from striving for perfection. So, I mean, what would you want Jesus to say to us? Like, go and sin less? I mean, that would be the alternative command. It's like, no, we are to strive for holiness. That is to be our goal, um, being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're empowered that we can accomplish far more on the path to holiness than we we think we can. Um, Any time that we fail, ultimately, we're not taking advantage of the resources that God has made available to us. So that's still the goal. Um, failing to reach that goal should be a motivating factor, not a, well, I'm never going to live up to it this time, therefore why even try? And so I think that's um, the wrong attitude. Yet it's a, something a lot of people struggle with. And truly, I've, I've seen that question many, many times um, in the history of God questions. So um, let's um, transition on to the incomprehensibility of God. I think they're closely related. I mean, the, ultimately, the holiness of God, we understand it to an extent yeah, but since the holiness points to God being so utterly different from anything else, we can't perfectly understand it. And we can understand the, the love of God, the justice of God. We, we understand what a perfect version of those things look like, but holiness is different. So with incomprehensibility, um, ultimately, Nelson, why don't you take this one? What does it mean that we cannot perfectly or fully understand God? Yeah, God's incomprehensibility of God you know, refers to us not being able to ever fully know him. And that should relieve us. We should, we should be um, relieved that we can't ever fully know God. Because could you imagine a God that you can fully understand every nuance, every bit, every character, every, every part? I mean, there are parts in this world. There are parts of, of nature, of the weather patterns that we still don't know. Uh, things about, but yet we could know about them. But God, he is so much greater, grander, right? He's holy, holy, holy. Uh, it's, it would be impossible. He's He's like an endless book that we can never reach the end as we read it, or, or an endless book, a great novel that a synopsis will never do justice for us to know truly who he is. That doesn't mean we can't know him, because certainly he reveals himself in Jesus Christ, and he reveals himself in scripture and in many other ways. But to know the incomprehensibility of God strictly deals with the the idea and the doctrine really that God can't be fully known because we are finite. We, we can't simply, we don't have the capacity ever to to fully um, comprehend the, the majesty, the gloriousness, the holiness, who God is, even in heaven. Uh, when we get there, we'll have all of eternity to discover every day new truths about our wonderful, loving creator. And those truths will never run out. We'll never run dry the things to talk about God and his majesty and of who he is and, and what he's able to do and what he has done. We will spend eternity um, trying to comprehend the greatness of the great I am. And, and so this doctrine is one, I think, of, of peace and some comfort. I don't want to be able to fit God in a box. I don't think anyone should. And I think for those people who um, are weary or are discouraged or who think I can't uh, I don't understand Christianity and because I don't understand God, good. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't, that shouldn't draw you away just because you can't understand everything about him. Like people uh, constantly think I can't understand his love and his wrath. I don't understand um, election or, or other doctrines and things like that. I don't understand these things. Well, sometimes things like the Trinity, you know, there, some of these things are beyond our comprehension to fully understand. And we need to be okay to in understanding that again, we're human. We're, we're finite. Truly, we can never understand who uh, God is completely. We can understand a great deal of him, um, and we can grow and learn more every single day, even throughout eternity, but we'll never exhaust the knowledge of God. I love that you said this is one that brings us peace, because I totally agree that, I mean, that we can understand God in part, but like, Obviously, we need that, and, and he's given us so much. But yeah, if we could fully wrap our minds around all of who God is, then I feel like he wouldn't be very much of a God, and I wouldn't need him. I would still pretty much be on my own. 
So knowing, wow, like God is beyond my full understanding um, does help me trust him more. And I love what you said, like an endless book. I mean, there's also just something so exciting and enticing about that, right? Like there's always more, there's always a deeper layer. Um, And I love that about really about the Bible, especially like there's so much just there on the surface, but then the deeper and deeper you go, like you get these connections and it's weaving together and that's God just taking you deeper and deeper. I think there's um, a verse like the, the secret things are for the Lord. Oh, well, but then something about there's something of like drawing stuff out is kind of like is our joy of getting to to go deep into those and search those out and yet also still know that there are secret things like we're not gonna fully understand everything so so we keep we keep trying and we keep diving in but we also come to a place of knowing you know i don't totally get it and that's okay and we can rest in that so so gwen what would be I don't know, maybe a, a couple of areas of theology where um, we at Got Questions have found that people fight and fight and fight, and they really they want to come up with the perfect system that perfectly explains something that ultimately it'd be far more valuable just to humbly accept God's incomprehensibility. Yeah, well, this was some of our pre-conversation. Um, so, you know, I think the Trinity is one that like nobody's ever going to get, but I think everybody's pretty comfortable with that. But Calvinism and Arminianism, there's just something about people just want one system to be right and one system to be wrong and to like stuff everything into those systems. And to me, it just doesn't make any sense. Like no one system is going to fully encapsulate all of it. Like there's paradox when we talk about, you know, God's God's sovereignty and human free will. Like, you know, the Bible kind of says both. How does that work? I don't really know, but you can't just toss one or the other. Um, so yeah, so for me, it's the Calvinism, Arminianism thing is sometimes like, you just got to give it up. Like they're helpful systems, but they aren't the be all end all. What does the Bible actually say? And don't try to stuff it into something. Yeah. And, and a verse you're referring to before, I, I have it here in my notes, oh, um, Deuteronomy great. chapter 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Meaning that God revealed, we can't know all of who God is, and there are secret things, but there are many things he has revealed to us in his law, in his word, and the things that we will cherish and our children will cherish for ongoing generations and generations because he's chosen to reveal those things to us. Uh, Augustine said, if you understood him, it would not be God. (laughs) <laughs> and and I, I really love the idea of, again, you can't fit God in some sort of box. And we have to be okay with not knowing and things not being completely comprehensible. And it's not that we're going to be lazy. I mean, we study and there are scholars far brighter than I uh, who, who still struggle with knowing some different doctrines and, and still struggle with certain truths of Scripture. Not that they struggle with their faith, but they struggle in comprehending it. And I think that's okay. And um, I think they um, would do a disservice if they could just easily say, well, here's all the, the steps and tricks of the Bible. I can understand everything completely and fully. And here's the, the do's and the don'ts, the rights and the wrongs. And uh, I think preachers and teachers do a disservice to their students and to their congregants when they can lay down the law and lay down the doctrines and without any qualm, without any caveat. Not that we shouldn't teach truth. We should stand upon truth. And there are certain truths that we'll stand upon, like the, the Trinity, right? We can't explain it fully, but of course we preach it with fervor and with fire and uh, mm-hmm. with truth. But we, we can't teach its finite details. We can't teach every single nuance about it. And that needs to be stated. And that needs to be okay with everyone who's learning and listening. Mm-hmm. Well, I love um, a few things that you pulled out there of it would be laziness to just give up. Um, And yet there's, okay, but I'm not going to arrive at putting God in a box. And I think that's that great balance of one way to love God with our minds is to search him out, like is to try to understand. And yet we do so knowing I'm never really going to arrive, like he's never going to fit in a box. And so that's, maybe that's the, the drawing and loving God with our hearts part too, of he's worthy of my worship. Like I can't just encapsulate him with my mind. Um, I've heard the phrase that if if you can perfectly understand your God, 
then your God is too small. And I think that really, really reflects what both of you have already pointed out, that is, is it truly a God if a um, human being can perfectly or fully understand him? And it, it's not the God of the Bible. Uh, when I think of like a passage in the Bible that most talks about the incomprehensibility of God, for me, it's Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, which reads, um, Oh, the depth of the riches of and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? So, yes, we are to try to understand God. There are scriptures re- uh, filled with examples of um, know God, to know his teachings, know his commands, to obey them, to um, teach them to others. So clearly we are to strive to know and to understand God. But with that also comes a humility that um, he is infinite, we are finite. He is eternal, uh, we are created. He is omnipotent, we are not. All of these things, they, it's, we can understand certain parts of God, aspects of God, characteristics of God, but we, we cannot, we can never, will never perfectly understand. A lot of people get this idea that, oh, when I get in heaven, then I'll, I'll perfectly understand everything about God and his ways. Like, I think we'll understand him better than we do now. We won't have sin holding us back. We'll be able to see him in all of his glory, but still, we will still be a finite being trying to understand an infinite being. So I don't think we'll ever perfectly understand God. And I think we need to be okay with that. I love, Gwen, what you said about um, Calvinism and Arminianism or the Trinity. You even say the deity and humanity of Christ. These are things I would love to be able to perfectly understand how those work. But I had to come to a point in my life because at one point I was one of those Calvinists or Arminians who wanted to come up with a system that perfectly explained everything. Coming to the point where like, you know, I don't understand this and I'm okay with that. And so many times like very personal or practical or counseling related questions we'll receive will be something along the lines of, I can't understand why God did this or why God allowed this. And it's like, no, we come in, we try to hear our, some principles, here's comfort, here's why you should still trust God, but we don't have to perfectly understand God and everything he does in order to trust him. I think it's a very important um way to distinguish the things. Um, Trust me, no one loves studying theology more than me. No one loves trying to help people understand God and his word more than me and the rest of the team at at God Questions. But um, we have to remember to draw the line and the point where thinking that we can perfectly understand everything about him and what he does. So in closing, um, to both of you, what for you is a good way that we actually apply the incomprehensibility of God to um, our day-to-day lives as followers of Christ. One of the errors of Job's friends when they were trying to comfort him was to assume that they knew God enough to say that they knew exactly what God was doing, how he was acting in Job's life, what uh, the consequences were for, the things he needed to change. And they assumed that knowledge um, based on some of it, based on, on good truth and some of it not. Um, but we see later on when, when God questions Job, he, he basically puts man in his place. Like, who are you to tell me? Who are you to search the depths? Do you know all these different things? And he goes on a laundry list of, you can't comprehend this. You can't comprehend that. You have no idea how this is this way. You have no idea why that is that way. And for me, it gives me a sense of pause when I'm dealing with individuals or going through something or myself to take time to understand what's going on and um, and to be okay sometimes with just saying, I don't know why God allowed this in your life. I can't give you a good answer for why this terrible thing happened or why this thing didn't happen for you. But I know God in the, in the, in the sense where he reveals himself to us. And I know uh, that what he's doing, uh, he, he loves us and cares for us. And uh, we need to depend on that, on his holiness, on his incomprehensibility. No matter what day-to-day things you know, happen in our own life, we need to trust uh, that the things that we cannot comprehend, that in Christ, in God, 
they aren't, um, they don't pull us away from him. It doesn't make him any less than, than we, who he is. It's just the fact that we can't understand it, but we can trust in God uh, who is in charge of controlling all of it. And it brings me a comfort I have to know that, to say, I don't know why, but I know about it. I trust him. Yeah, I think for me, um, similar in some ways in terms of that um, humility piece of I'm not going to know everything. So um, so kind of having that posture of openness to be willing to learn. And I think, you know, practically within the church that helps with that idea of theological triage. You know, like if somebody disagrees with me, maybe they're right. Maybe we're both wrong. I mean, you know, so kind of that putting things in their proper perspective and being willing to learn. Um, I think it does help me stand in awe of God and even deeper gratitude for the things that I do understand and the things that he does reveal and those things we can really um, just hang our hat on that we know, okay, well, this is sure. Um, I also love that to me, God's incomprehensibility is also an invitation to relationship and to deeper. Um, So in Ephesians 1, Paul prays, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, and on and on and on, but um, kind of this idea of God gave us his Holy Spirit so that we could understand. So there's this, okay, God is incomprehensible, but also he invites us in and he gives us understanding. So I think that too also helps me be humble of, okay, if I'm going to understand something, like I need God to do it. It's not just my brain that's going to figure it out. There's some spiritual knowledge um, here that I need. Yeah, the psalmist was okay with it, right? As he praised God, you know, Psalm yes. 145, 3, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is uncertain, right? Yes. Incomprehensible. And I think that's an attribute worthy of our praise, and one that brings a lot of comfort. I think, um, yeah, um, I think Nelson just stole what I was going to say. So I try to do is piggyback on that, but no, like, people look at the incomprehensibility of God as something that's bad and scripture presents it as something that's good. That the fact that we can't understand God should help us to both um, be in awe of him more than we are to recognize his holiness, his set apartness more than we do, but then also to trust him that even I don't see how you're going to work this out, but I'm going to trust you. I don't understand why you're doing this, but I'm going to trust you. So I think scripture presents the incomprehensibility of God as a good thing, a very good thing. And we need to remember that. Um, I think that's a a great application for me, even as someone who we we answer questions for a living. This is God's calling on our lives is to help people find answers. We even need to be reminded that, you know, we don't have all the answers. God's word has everything that we need to know, but it doesn't have everything that we want to know. So living in that tension, I think, is important. And the incomprehensibility of God is a powerful reminder of that. So Gwen, Nelson, thank you for joining me for this conversation. I truly enjoyed it. Looking forward to this series as we go through the attributes of God together. This has been the Got Questions podcast on what is the holiness of God and what is the incomprehensibility of God. Got Questions, the Bible has answers, and we'll help you find them.